This is the human side of healthcare, where we explore all aspects of today's ever changing healthcare environment. Brought to you by the Dallas Fort Worth Hospital Council and featuring CEO Stephen Love with co host Thomas Miller. Now, let's make healthcare human again. Welcome to the human side of healthcare. We're delighted you're with us today. You know, Thomas, we're going to open the show today, and I was dumbfounded by the definition that I heard, and it affects one in three women and one in four men. We're talking about domestic violence, and one of the reasons why this is so important, as you're going to hear in just a minute, the definition of domestic violence might surprise you. And many of us followed a big national story a few months back where a couple traveling in a van together who were in love and high school sweethearts turned into a deadly situation. And we're going to be talking to Shayla Camacho, who is the public health educator, works in the Victim Intervention Program in the Rape Crisis Center at Parkland Health and Hospital System. Shayla, welcome to the show. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me today. You know, just to set the stage for our listeners, can you give them your definition of domestic violence? Absolutely. Um, My definition of domestic violence would be any series of pattern behaviors. So the partner uses to maintain and control the person that they're dating or married to. And so these behaviors could be uh, emotional or physical in the in the way that is not healthy. And so we, we sure will look out for that when it comes to domestic violence is a series of pattern behaviors. You know, for our listeners, how common do you experience domestic violence? How common is it? Unfortunately, it is a lot more common than what some statistics show. But nationwide, it shows about 81% of women and about 43% of men in the United States have experienced some form of assault in their lifetime. And so, and unfortunately, some statistics show that in the state of Texas, it's about one in three Texans over the age of 18 that will experience some form of abuse by their partner in their lifetime. That's an interesting statistic, one in three. So it's extremely commonplace. Can you give our listeners examples of common victims that have domestic violence? Right. So um, unfortunately, there is no specific like characteristic or trait that we can look out for. But what we do understand and know is that uh, domestic violence comes in different forms. So it could be physical violence, the hitting, the shoving, the black eye, like what most people think of or what they've seen in movies. But it could also be sexual violence or emotional abuse, financial abuse, digital or verbal abuse. So it does come in many ways. But one thing I really want to point out is that unfortunately domestic violence uh, doesn't discriminate. So it doesn't matter the age, the gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, um, and it doesn't matter the education. A lot of people will say, I'm too smart or you're too smart to let that happen, but it has nothing to do with, with our intelligence. What would you tell someone if they're a victim of domestic violence? What would you advise them to do? The first thing I would advise anyone, if anyone has ever mentioned this or this resonates or hits close to home, is that it's not that person's fault, uh, the victim of abuse. It's not their fault that this is this is happening to them. And one thing I always recommend, if you're the person of a loved one who's who is dating someone that may be abusive or married to someone that's abusive, is that please don't judge them. I know it's it's hard to to say that and and to actually put it into practice. Um, but if we know someone that's going through them, please don't judge and and remind them that there are agencies out there that are able and capable of doing what we like to call safety planning. So things to put in place before someone is getting ready to leave because the moment this person leaves their abusive relationship, it's one of the highest lethality points. So one of those really high risk behaviors that could lead to unfortunate um, homicide in some cases. And we want to prevent that. So there are agencies out there that can help. You know, when you think in terms of domestic violence, you mentioned different ages. Unfortunately, there is violence against children. Does that fall in the category of domestic violence? It, so the domestic violence would be the umbrella term. It would fall under the category of family violence. So let's say dad's abusing child or, or mom's abusing child or, or grandparents abusing somebody. Yes, that would be considered under domestic violence. Um, but when we talk about 
with the most common form of domestic violence, it would probably be intimate partner violence. So two people that are dating or going out or in a relationship with each other. You know, if you suspect someone is a victim of domestic violence, what should you do? Because you don't want to make false accusations. That's absolutely correct. No, we, we want to take the, the word value. And so a lot of agencies, that's exactly what they do. Even here at the Victim Intervention Program slash Rape Crisis Center here at Parkland, we don't ask, for example, where are the pictures of the bruises or where is that police report? We believe the victim at face value. So whatever you tell me, we hold that to be true. And so one of the steps that we do take when it comes to reporting is, is are you ready for this? And if not, there are different avenues that we can take. Because again, being able to recall what has happened to, to you is never an easy step, but there are trained professionals to help out if needed. You know, when you do have domestic violence and there needs to be treatment involved, what are some of the services you recommend? So here at Parkland, one of the really amazing benefits that, that we have, and very few hospitals in the United States even have this, is that the victim intervention program is embedded within the medical facility. So basically, if someone comes in to the doors of Parkland and they disclose some form of abuse, an advocate will be there. So our advocates are 24-7. And what they do with the patient is they do not force anything on them. They do not make them make a, a police report. What they do um, actually do is here are some of the steps that we can offer for your safety because we are concerned that it has escalated to that level where I do need to see a doctor. Um, and so we offer a plethora of information, whether it's crime victims compensation information, helping them find a shelter that's 24 seven if they can't return back to their home or just doing that safety planning of I'm getting my steps ready to leave this potentially um, fatal relationship. What can I do? And they're in a really amazing thing and I will say this time and time again, is that they don't judge. It doesn't matter what you were wearing, what you were doing, how you look like. They're generally here just to help that person out. So let me ask you this, and I'll give you a scenario. One of the intimate partners is a victim of domestic violence. They come to your program. They ask for your help, but they do it anonymously. The perpetrator doesn't know. How do you guarantee protection for them? So there's never, ever a guarantee in anything, especially in life. But what we do, we do take extra precautionary steps that we have here in the hospital. For example, um, the way our technology is set up is where not even nurses or doctors can look at our notes personally. It's secured in a different way, as well as our waiting room, even within the hospital setting, is internal. So you have to be buzzed in. that You can't just walk into our waiting room. So we do try to put these safety measures in place because we we know that the strictest form of confidence is coming from us, whether it's an employee or someone that's from the Dallas community seeking help. We want to let them know um, that we're available. Also, with the information we give out, majority of the time, it's a brochure or something of that nature. If it's someone that we know is would be considered high risk, we have the we develop these really cool shoe cards. They're the size of your business card. Um, and they're sweat resistant and it's got our information. So if their per- partner is going to look through their purse or their backpack or their wallet, they're actually able to hide this information in their shoe. Um, so then that way, when they're ready to call, they can make that call. Perhaps one of the most important segments we've aired here on the human side of healthcare, Shayla Camacho, Parkland Health and Hospital System. We're going to talk about domestic violence and your kids and lessons from Brian and Gabby next. This is the human side of healthcare, where we feature healthcare's hottest topics and what our North Texas area hospitals are doing to make healthcare human again. Welcome back. We're continuing a very important conversation with Shayla Camacho of Parkland Health and Hospital System about domestic violence. The statistics are staggering. And as Shayla pointed out in our last segment, it's not just physical. This is verbal and emotional. Now, here is Steve to continue our conversation. You know, for our listeners out there who may have been subjected to domestic violence and currently may be having that issue, and it's a very serious problem, if it escalates to a critical emergency, what should they do? I will always recommend, please call 911. No matter that kind of situation, you really, at the end of the day, the police are there to protect you. And so we want to make sure that that happens as well as, and this is something some people forget, is that 
making a police report leaves a paper trail for people to understand how severe um, this relationship has gotten to the point where I've had to call the police multiple times where we need to make an arrest. And um, we're very fortunate to live in an amazing state of Texas, go Texas, um, where the family violence laws are very strict, where they really do try to protect not only the victim, but the victim's family if there are kids involved as well. So we always recommend calling 911. And I will let you guys know that we're about, there is about eight different nonprofit agencies that help families and children affected by abuse 24-7 at no cost. I know you said that domestic violence comes in different shapes, forms, age ranges, ethnicities. Are there any common warning signs? I think one of the most common signs that we see a lot is you invite someone out or you invite them to like a family gathering of that nature and they're always asking for permission. Let me double check. Let me make sure it's okay. And then the other form is that isolation of this person used to really be involved in our congregation or this person used to volunteer a lot. Uh, and now they're, they're bailing on certain events. Like they no longer show up. I haven't heard from this person in a while. I hope this person's still okay. So that isolation factor is what we do see Unfortunately, a lot, but it's because at the end of the day, the person who is abusive is trying to get power and control. And one of the ways to achieve that is if I cut off your support system, who's going to be able to give you those red flags, right? Because sometimes when we're in love or we want to make this relationship work, we may overlook some things that our friends and family could say, no, that's not okay. And I'm worried about you. You know, you mentioned in your answer about people become more isolated you know, I know for the last two years, a lot of people have been isolated because of the pandemic. Have you seen an increase in the last two years in domestic violence? Absolutely. And unfortunately, yes. So we do keep in contact. We, I'm part of the Domestic Violence Awareness Coalition for Dallas. And we do talk about the number of hotline calls or how our emergency shelters are reaching capacity um, but there is a study by the Texas Council on Family Violence, and it showed that between 2019 and 2020, there was a 23% increase in homicide. And this is just talking about domestic violence, and that 67% of these victims were unfortunately killed in their own home. So when we say home equals safe, we know that that isn't always necessarily true. Hi, Shayla. This is Thomas. I'd like to ask you a few questions, but to get the context set up again, would you please restate the definition of domestic violence as you stated it earlier? Yes. So I will describe it as a pattern of behaviors. So it's used by your, the abusive partner to try and like the goal would be to maintain power and control over the victim or over their partner that is being abused. Boy, what is then that thin line between human manipulation that we can be really good at, like pouting or some of that low-level frustrated anger that's used to manipulate versus crossing that invisible line into domestic violence? Oh, wow, that's a great question. And I think like most things in life, it's on a spectrum. So we, we, we're on that spectrum of relationship, whether it's like really healthy that what we see and we want to embody to that kind of gray area, which is what a lot of which a lot of the abusive relationship is, is in that gray area of is it toxic, is it unhealthy, and then towards the end, which is just extreme, like I'm going to be killed by this person if I don't get out. And so something to really look out for is at the end of the day, the actions that you're choosing for yourself, is it because you're walking on eggshells? Is it because you're worried of how that other person will react to your choices is that what we're doing, what we're doing? And that's when we need to realize that we may be in an abusive relationship if I say yes to that, right? I'm not going to wear this because it's going to trigger my partner. I'm not going to be loud or be funny because they've told me in the car to be quiet before we got out to join this party. Am I changing who I am to appease this other person because of retaliation or what could happen to me? You know, you hear people who break up after they have left a relationship, they'll say, I just lost myself in that relationship. It's easy to do, isn't it? Absolutely. Yes. Especially because abusive relationships, there's the cycle of the honeymoon phase. Everything's really good and really happy. And then it's these minor adjustments that we're making that is, since it's so subtle, by the time I realize what's going on, you're like, wow. They're very meticulous and manipulative in their behavior, and they know that. 
You know, and this is not physical. So in other words, nobody's hiding any bruises and nobody's throwing things across the room. This is emotional. Why do people stay in those kinds of relationships? Because words truly have power over anybody. And I can give you a very simple example. It's when people want to apply for it, for example, for a job. And you're like, oh, should I apply? And you're like, no, I don't have the credentials, so I'm not going to do it. And so you miss out on that opportunity. No one told you you couldn't do it. You told yourself that it wasn't possible. And it's just for a job application. So imagine when you've been told with words that I love you, I love you, I love you. Your cooking is amazing. I love what, what, you're, what you made for me. And then all of a sudden you make a dish. And then they're like, what happened to you? This dish was horrible. It tasted the worst. Are you going to believe that person? Yeah, because they've always complimented that, that plate that I've made. And so maybe I did do something wrong when you really hadn't. That's the power of words and gaslighting and manipulation. They, they do carry a lot of weight, unfortunately. Would you explain the term gaslighting? Yeah, so gaslighting is one of these tactics that people will use to make you start questioning yourself. That gut feeling that you have will slowly start to go away because a person that's constantly reminding you that you're doing something wrong. And when we hear it over and over and over again, we start to believe it. And so part of that gaslighting is making you second guess every decision that you've made. I texted you to bring this. No, you didn't. I called you and you said you were going to be home. No, you didn't. And when we hear that over and over again, we do start to question, maybe I didn't send that message. Maybe I forgot to mention this. And that's part of gaslighting. Let me flip genders here for a second. What do you tell men who might be in a domestic violence situation of their own? Absolutely. One thing I want to remind them that, it's, again, it's not just gender specific. Nationwide, it's 43% of men in the United States who've experienced some form of like assault in their lifetime. And so one thing I really want to stress out is that you shouldn't have to question your masculinity, right? Second thing that's very, very important is that get help. If you really, truly need it, there is help out there. Again, the Victim Intervention Program slash Rape Crisis and here at Parkland, we're able to help not only just women and children, but men as well. But according to Texas Council on Family Violence, uh, 40 men were killed by their female partner in 2020. So again, it's not something that should be overlooked or said, well, you're being too sensitive. Toughen up, man up. Absolutely not. If you believe that you are in an abusive relationship, there is so many resources available for you to get help. I'd love your comments on this national situation that we watched together recently a few months back where a young couple, their names were Brian and Gabby, high school sweethearts, decided to travel America in a van and document their experience, and it turned deadly south because of domestic violence. And it was plain to see, both in a restaurant encounter and an encounter with the Moab Police Department. Then 10 days later, Gabby was found dead. Could you comment on that situation? What are some takeaways? Honestly, I was, and I'll be as candid as possible, I was floored with the cameras that the police had of that interaction, because that is where you can tell so many people have really focused on training law enforcement to respond to domestic violence. I can guarantee you that a couple years back, it would have just been like, y'all stop arguing, get in the van and go away. One of the really key and very important things I want to highlight from that encounter was that both police officers separated Gabby and they separated Brian so they could get the recollection of events that happened before they would have interviewed together. And I can guarantee you that it, she would have been like, it was my fault, my bad, and not said anything else. They had time to finally disclose what was going on. And at the end, they're like, hey, she's taking the van. You're going to stay over here and take time to cool off. And I think that that was incredible. But one thing that you're absolutely hitting on is that it was a true story of they were high school sweethearts. There was good. There was bad. And then at the end, there was this tragedy. And if you've ever looked at like the interviews of their friends and family, you could tell. Absolutely, they knew, but they didn't know what to do. And part of that is just us as as caring human beings, if you realize something's going on, not to tell that person, leave, you need to get divorced or go away. You just need to say, I'm worried about your safety. Is everything okay? And start having a conversation about, well, what's going to happen? Or is there anything I can do? And then remind them that there is help out there. We're going to turn this conversation over toward the effects on our children when we come back. This is Shayla Camacho, Parkland Health and Hospital System, talking about the very important topic of domestic violence. We'll continue right after this. 
Welcome back to the human side of healthcare, where we explore how to take better care of your health so you can live a happier, healthier life. With DFW Hospital Council CEO Stephen Love, along with Thomas Miller. Welcome back to the human side of healthcare. This is a very important topic that we're continuing over because we wanted to apply it to our kids. Statistically, nationally, for adults, 81% of women and 43% of men will experience some form of domestic violence in their lifetimes. So we want to not only protect ourselves, but also our children. We're talking with Shayla Camacho. She's public health educator of Victim Intervention Program, the Rape and Crisis Center at Parkland Health and Hospital System. And Shayla, before we hop over to the kids, I'd like to just ask you about how do we intervene if we're a third party looking through the window of somebody's life and we see a potential problem, but no attack has happened, no crime has been committed. We just see something that to us looks like it doesn't feel right, like Gabby's mom or the waitress in the restaurant, as we talked about before. What can we do? So as far as like maybe the waitress or third party events in that nature, it's just if you truly feel someone needs help, I always say check your safety first. Always make sure that your safety is not being compromised trying to help somebody else. In the case of Gabby's mom noticing these things, and then this is this is just true advice that we that we encourage people to practice is that don't give up on that person. It's really hard, right? If I've told you leave that or don't be with them, but don't at the end of the day wash your hands, quote unquote, and say, I'm done. Goodbye. Be resilient in that form of just, hey, like, I know you haven't called me. Can you at least message me? Or what's going on? Can you, you maybe you can't make it to dinner, but let's grab a coffee. Try to be um, a little bit flexible with that situation. Because again, at the end of the day, they're being unfortunately controlled by somebody else. They may not outright say they are, but their behavior will suggest otherwise. But focus on the fact that we can still create change to avoid that in the future, whether it's reminding the person that it's not their fault or us volunteering at different places to get more information. So at the end of the day, the more conversations we have about abusive relationships or about unhealthy behaviors, the less acceptable it becomes to society and the more likely we are to speak up and feel comfortable about it when we do see it in real life. Ah, Great answer. Let's shift over to our kids now. You know, we're all hearing that kids, even in elementary school, are feeling inferior because of what other kids are saying, what their parents may be saying, and especially what they see and hear on social media. Oh, yes. Uh, Before this job, I used to go into middle schools and high schools and talk about healthy communication and boundaries. (laughs) And let me tell you, that was such a fun journey because I would have 12-year-olds tell me that they are in love and that they found the one, and no, nothing was ever going to separate them. I was like, wow, okay, <laughs> that's new. <laughs> so what kind of pressure are these kids facing, and what should they do? I think one of the biggest pressures that they face, and, and it's something really simple that us as adults can talk to them about, is the power of saying no and being okay with that, like stand your ground when you say no. And the second thing is healthy boundaries, as in you don't have to give your partner your password, right? Because that, or else that means that you're cheating on me. Or you do have time to make time for your family away from your partner. And again, you can put your your partner and family together, but you have time for just yourself. So I think one of the biggest pressures that they face is not understanding how I can say no and it for them not to be people pleasers in that aspect. And what about bullying for our kids? We hear so much about that. Is that under domestic violence or how do you classify that? That would fall under another department, um, but we do deal with abuse in the sense of my family maybe verbally abusing me, physically abusing me, or it could be that my partner is, and then that's what bullying is when it comes to a relationship, is is that that's what abuse is. They call me names. They tell me to lose weight. They tell me I'm not good enough. All that quote-unquote bullying would be considered that verbal, emotional abuse. They give me the silent treatment because I didn't respond right away to a text message. And then there's overlap, right? With abusive families, sometimes we'll see human trafficking involved, right? Mom or dad set me up to be a victim of trafficking. So we do see overlap. So sometimes our department is able to help in that aspect. And then kind of a cousin, finally, you've been so gracious with your time. Thank you for this amazing conversation. 
sporting events, big in the state of Texas, and there's a parent screaming at their kid that they're not performing up to their standard. Uh, yeah, yes, especially because sometimes that form of, of bullying or verbal abuse will turn into an anxiety disorder, right? I'm not good enough. I'm never going to do this. And so they overwork their bodies sometimes to the point where they're, they're falling down because I had to work out twice as hard and I'm not eating right. So, no, we do see, unfortunately, a lot of that overlap. You know, as you talk to our listeners today, what do you really want to resonate with our listeners with as we close out the segment? Um, I would like just to remind everyone that all forms of intimate partner violence are preventable. So people who make that excuse of, I was just too drunk or I was on under the influence of something, those do play a factor in the abusive relationship, but that's not the reason why someone is choosing to harm you and you don't deserve that ever. Shayla, thank you so much for these amazing comments. All of this is on our podcast, The Human Side of Healthcare. It's on all the major podcast players. If you feel that you have been exposed potentially to domestic violence, please go back and listen to the first three segments of the show so that you can hear this entire interview and all of the information in it. We've been listening to Shayla Camacho from the Victim Intervention Program, the Rape Crisis Center at Parkland Health and Hospital System. Steve, such critical information. Absolutely. And I think, as you said earlier, this could be happening in some of our listeners' households, and they may not have known it. Let's take a pivot and talk about something else that affects most of us, and that is visiting the doctor and how we can make that more efficient, especially lessons learned over the last two years. Yes, we're going to be talking about how we're digitizing healthcare, and you've heard about telemedicine and all the great changes that are occurring that hopefully is going to make healthcare more readily accessible and produce better outcomes for all of us. We're delighted that we've got with us today Mr. Matthew Albers, who's the Assistant Vice President of the Digital Experience at Cook Children's. Matthew, welcome to the show. Hi there. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. You know, to kind of set the stage for our listeners so they really grasp and see the impact of how consumers are really changing health care, can you explain to our listeners about telehealth, telemedicine, especially during this pandemic, and then we're going to move into the digital experience? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, my job my job is quite a bit easier over the past few years compared to what I've been doing over the last decade plus now. Prior, when I had to describe uh, what telehealth was, uh, most folks would look at me uh, a bit confused. Uh, but now I think most people at least understand, they know what Zoom is, and they understand they can meet and chat with their doctor um, over the internet using their app on the phone or the computer to speak with their provider or with their doctor. We've seen some major trends and movement beyond just telemedicine and virtual health. Uh, Depending on which which group you're speaking with, they may use those terms interchangeably. Um, But that is that's certainly something that that we've been focusing on here with Cook Children's is how do we provide care for our patients, our little patients and their families while they're either stuck at home or or on vacation uh, and can't particularly get into the clinic. You know, as you look at telehealth, telemedicine, the digital experience, I know you listen to the consumers. What in your mind of what consumers truly expect from their healthcare experience? Yeah, that's a great question. And and honestly, it's it's the same thing, and I would actually say higher than they expect from other industries. Uh, there, there's a common phrase going around over the last few years, which is, your best last experience is your new expectation. And that's the case uh, in healthcare. So if you recently, uh, for example, if you use your app to order food or do a pickup at Target or order your Chipotle for lunch, that's your expectation for convenience from a consumer perspective. I'll give an example. A couple of years ago, I was with my family at Disney World. And for those who have, who have felt the Disney experience, it starts well before you step foot on their grounds. 
Now they've got their, their magic bands. They've got mobile applications. They know everything about you as you step foot on their campus in their city. They can personalize your photos, your meal service, uh, your wait times for the lines, and it's a wonderfully personalized experience. Our patients, their families, they have that same expectation when they walk on one of our campuses at one of our doctor's offices, um, and that's their expectation, that their doctor is ready and waiting for them, that they know as much information about them that they've already input into the application, into the internet, into the website, right? They have this expectation that their doctor knows who they are, why they're there, and really it's a convenience thing. So just like any other industry we've seen, especially with, with COVID-19, is this kind of renewed expectation for convenience. And when we speak with our patients, our families, uh, at Cook Children's, we have several um, advisory groups and committees of, of past patients, current patients, and families. And what we hear from them is they really do want to interact with Cook Children's while they're at home. They want to uh, not fill out a bunch of paperwork when they get into the doctor's office. Uh, they want that to be a quick and convenient experience. Uh, and that's what we're, my group, um, from a digital experience perspective, is, is acutely focused on, but it really does take the village of, of our doctors, our nurses, our administration, and operations staff to actually make that a reality. Do we have an amen? <laughs> this is Matt Albers, Assistant Vice President of Digital Experience at Cook Children's Healthcare System. We're going to continue this conversation about how we used to do it the old-fashioned way. And maybe that's returning when we return on the human side of healthcare. Covering the healthcare topics that matter most to North Texas. This is the human side of healthcare with DFW Hospital Council CEO Stephen Love, along with Thomas Miller. Welcome back to the human side of healthcare. We're continuing this conversation about what medical care might look like in the future based on the recent past. We're talking with Matthew Albers, the Assistant Vice President of Digital Experience at Cook Children's Healthcare System. Steve? You know, Matthew, it's great. We're talking about telehealth and we're talking about telemedicine. We're talking about digital access to your personal health information. Is there anything you can tell our listeners if they are a little worried about their privacy and keeping that information confidential? I think that's a great question. And one of the things we, we feel is most important, and I, I speak with our chief information security officer here at Cook Children probably every day and our chief privacy officer probably every day, because it, it's really important that from an ethical perspective and from a privacy perspective, we're not using that information in a way that it gets into the wrong hands of the wrong individuals. There are laws and rules out there. Um, one of the ones you've likely heard of is HIPAA, which relates to your privacy and security of your health information, uh, are things that are, that are still relevant in a digital world. They are more relevant than they probably were in 1996 when that passed. Because data is so liquid now and it can be interchangeable. So I do 100% recognize that as a patient, as a consumer, you fully have that right to secure your health information, keep it private, that's absolutely imperative. In the same breath, the opportunity is, is ripe because unlike ever before, we now have real-time research happening with millions and millions of people that allows your doctors, your nurses, your care team to actually give you a more personalized treatment plan with higher confidence that it's going to work. Hi, Matthew. This is Thomas. I'd like to ask you a question based on a real-life situation that I recently had. My little three-month-old granddaughter got COVID. And she was sick. My son had to take her to the emergency room. I called him after maybe about three hours after I knew he would have arrived, asking if he had been seen yet. Well, actually, he went to a great facility in the Metroplex, and he had been seen and was on his way home, actually. But, you know, there was that expectation. I was concerned that he might be there with her in the ER for a long afternoon. When do you think we'll see an expectation that reverses that, like an expectation of quick service? 
it, it will happen. And I think your expectation as your, as your granddaughter uh, felt is one that's shared across, I'd say, most people. Those are things that we talk about daily. It's how can we help you as a mom or a dad or a grandfather not have to wait in a waiting room. Healthcare is an industry where we still use the word waiting room. Even car dealerships have gotten away from that. I think they call it the customer lounge. So that's something that, that we, need to, we need to resolve. It's very doable. Other industries have done it. And those are things that, that my team and our group here at Cook Children's um, talk about very frequently to reduce that wait time or at least allow you to maybe wait at home or give you better expectations when they're running behind um, and give you real-time updates. So those are things that we're, we're working on. And in many of our locations, you can take advantage of those things today. Yeah, that's a great point, because I was thinking about where could I go out there and contact COVID if I wanted to bump into it? Well, obviously, a pharmacy, a doctor's office, an ER or an urgent care. But when I go to order a a dinner like I did this past weekend, they'll bring it out to the car. I didn't have to go in at all. They said, what kind of vehicle are you in? And they came out to me. You know, and I grew up, Steve grew up in an era when it was expected that that the doctor would visit you at home if you were sick. They didn't want you in the doctor's office. You know, as you think about some of the solutions to that, what goes through your mind? What are some of the real life solutions that might parallel some of these other examples that are going on in other industries? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, from a Cook Children's perspective, Um, One of the very first things we did during COVID-19 was exactly what you mentioned is last thing we want people doing is congregating in a waiting room. Um, We stood up a program called our virtual waiting room, which allows patients and families to text when they're on their way and text when they've arrived in our parking lot. They can wait there um, and then their nursing staff or doctor can text them to say, hey, come on in when it's time. And they bypass the waiting room entirely. That's low hanging fruit. That's, that's a pretty simple change. It removes people from congregating, but it doesn't really get to the root of your comment. Especially, I really love the black bag doctor situation at home. Those are coming back, and they're coming back in force. Um, if you were to Google hospital at home, that's a very hot digital experience buzzword these days uh, for how do we extend care back into the home where patients and families are. That's the most comfortable place to receive care. If we can find a way to actually deliver it there, I think we will have done our job. And it's, it's kind of funny that we can leverage the, the legacy and history of medicine in its early days and go back to that by leveraging technology at scale. Well, and that kind of skirts across that regulatory barricade that we were talking about. However, We have a provider shortage out there. So if we're talking about more clogs on the ground, if you will, how can we do? We need more providers, don't we? We absolutely need more providers. We need more nurses. We need more healthcare professionals in general. Um, Burnout is a very real thing right now across many industries. It's definitely a hot topic here in healthcare, not just with Cook Children's, not in the Metroplex, but across the nation. Um, You know, interestingly, we talk about virtual care and telehealth. Uh, all the data suggests it, it is a bit more efficient uh, than an in-person visit, although it's not as efficient as you might expect. Essentially, getting more, more juice out of the lemon or the orange. There's other types of care models. Asynchronous care is a term that, that's thrown around now, which allows you to text pictures, short videos. Think of, think of TikTok or Instagram for doctors. And you can text those conditions and things, and your provider can respond asynchronously on their own time to provide a treatment plan, a prescription for low acuity things, or maybe chronic things that need a, a prescription update. Those things save loads of time. Consider a doctor would take 15 minutes out of their schedule to see you for a routine follow-up. For something like that, maybe contact dermatitis or something very low acuity, they can do that in, in literally 60 to 90 seconds. So your efficiency can go through the roof by leveraging technology. Um, and I think it can also allow providers and doctors to focus their efforts and time where it's needed most uh, for some of those patients who might not have those types of situations, who really need that in-person visit. You know, massive change like this in any industry is always mandated or dictated by some external force, right? There's a reason that we need to make the change. Otherwise, we just stay the course. 
Has COVID-19 been enough of a catalyst for us to make these changes rapidly? And then if you were to look into your crystal ball, what kind of time frame before this kind of thing is mainstream? Yeah, you know, there, there was absolutely a tipping point. I think at one point with, with Cook Children's, at least, more than half of our interactions with patients were happening virtually. So it shook it up, whereas before it was, it was less than 1%, and Cook Children's was not alone in that. Um, the industry blew up pretty much overnight uh, during that, those weeks in February and March of 2020. Um, mainstream, I, I think it's here. I think now um, organizations like Cook uh, and others are finding ways to operationalize these programs a bit more uh, sophisticated, um, whereas before it may have been sort of a patch or quilt work. Uh, now we're, we're fully integrating into the overall experience. And like I mentioned um, regarding Prosper, uh, we are looking at really redesigning that experience from the ground up, and that takes not just technology. Technology is only one part of it. Um, it takes people. It takes humans to make that change possible. It takes process and process updates. It takes business model changes. So I think regulatory uh, from a federal, state, local level is going to be critical um, to, to keep the momentum here. And uh, I think consumers and patients got a taste for it and now we're seeing they want it and if if cook children's doesn't offer it or if somebody else doesn't offer it they're going to go shopping somewhere else and that's that's their right to do that um so it's it's really up to us uh in healthcare to catch up matthew albers from cook children's healthcare system thank you very much for your thoughts about the future thanks for joining us on the human side of healthcare today We continue to try to bring you interesting information about how our hospitals give back to the community. We want you to stay safe, and we'll see you next week.